bright and shiny. Let's try that again. Good morning, church. There we go. Welcome this morning. Grateful uh, that you're here today as we gather together uh, to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. A few announcements for you. Uh, Things going on in the life of our church family. And so let me make you aware of that. Um, First off, um, a week from this coming Friday, so almost two weeks from today, or almost two weeks from today, uh, we have Secret Church. Uh, That'll be in the parlors. There's actually a sign up at the back of the foyer where you can sign up uh, for that. Um, That'll start at 6 p.m. on Friday, April the 19th. Um, It'll be a study of the book of Ruth, and so that'll be a good time for us, so be sure uh, you sign up for that. Um, Also, it's hard to believe, but we are getting our ducks in a row for vacation Bible school this summer. And so next Sunday, following morning worship, we'll have a short meeting um, for anyone who is able to help us with that ministry. And so be sure and stick around after morning worship next Sunday. LaTanya Caton is our VBS director. And so if you have questions, uh, you can ask her those questions. Um, Lawn care, uh, grass is growing. And so there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer to sign up uh, to help with the lawn care. Remember what we say, if everybody does something, then nobody has to do everything. And so we're asking you... Uh, to sign up to take a two-week block in the summer uh, to care for the lawn. And if enough people do that, then we've got it taken care of. So if you haven't signed up for that, uh, help us out with that. Um, Also, next Sunday, April 14th, Lord's Supper during morning worship, and also our monthly committee meetings next Sunday at 5.30 in the parlor. And so want to make you all aware of that. Um, so uh, those are the announcements. I need to introduce you to a couple of people. We have a, a special day today, gathering together um, for a full day, a fellowship, time together in the Word for our uh, spring Bible conference. Um, right here uh, to my right is Casey Flint. Casey is the uh, worship pastor at uh, Trinity Baptist Church in Amarillo. He's actually a missionary from Oklahoma to the state of Texas. Uh, he grew up in the Oklahoma Panhandle. Uh, grew up at the uh, First Baptist Church of Hooker. Uh, went to school in Turpin. And so he's a Panhandle boy. And we're glad to have him with us uh, to lead us in worship today. And then we have with us Dr. Todd Fisher. Uh, Dr. Fisher serves as the Executive Director Treasurer for Oklahoma Baptists and a gifted teacher, a great man of God, loves the church, loves Oklahoma Baptists, and we're thrilled to have him with us today and excited for how he's going to teach us. Um, so schedule for today, um, we will have potluck lunch right after this service, and then we'll be back in here at 2 o'clock. And then you'll get another break, and we'll be back in here at 6.30. So that's the schedule uh, for today. And so let me, uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll have our call to worship. And so let's pray together. And so, Father, we are grateful to be in this place together today. We're grateful for these two men that you have gifted the church with, that you have brought to us today uh, to lead us, to help us, grow in our love for Christ. Uh, Father, we pray that in our time together, uh, you would uh, just bless this time. Father, that you would use these men, um, that your spirit would work in this place. Father, that you would speak to us through your word. And Father, that you would cause us to love you more and follow you more closely. So Father, we pray uh, that you would move in our time together today. In the name of Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen. And I'm going to have to grab my Bible. The call to worship this morning comes from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6. I hear this word as we just turn our attention upon the Lord Jesus Christ today. A voice says, cry. And I say, what shall I cry? 
all flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the, Lord, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's worship together. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be here with you this morning. As I said, my name is Casey Flint, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be with you today to lead you in worship. Uh, let's stand together this morning as we enter into uh, praise and worship together by singing all creatures of our God and King.
in the darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin king of the world from the throne of endless glory to a great This morning, I want to uh, I want to kind of introduce the next song that we're going to be doing together, uh, which is called "Is He Worthy?" And many of you will know it from the radio or from various things. But it does something called a call and response, which is fairly straightforward. I'm going to sing a line, and then you will respond with the next line. But we see this in the Book of Psalms, and it's particularly apt out of Psalm 136. So I want to do this. Just 
we're going to call this practice together, okay? Um, so I'm going to read a line from Psalm, and you're going to respond with, for his steadfast love endures forever. Can you remember that, everybody? Good? All right, cool. Here we go. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Do you feel the world's broken? Me too. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting Ah. Uh -huh. 
God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name, he in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Father God, we come before you this morning recognizing that you are a holy and righteous and sovereign God. We recognize that you are worthy. As we ask the question, is he worthy in that song, we know the answer is a resounding yes. And we see this played out in our lives, but we see it most of all in your word that we'll be talking about today. We thank you, God, for giving us your word that we may study, that we may meditate on, that we may memorize to apply it to every aspect of our lives. Father, I ask that today you would open up your word in a wonderful way, that you would teach us more about who you are and what your will is for our lives. As we go from here, let us be inspired to share your word with others. Let us be burdened for the lost and the dying that are all around us in this world. Father, I thank you for all you do. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Casey. Let's make our declaration of faith together this morning. This is a little different uh, this morning. I've altered it to fit um, our focus today, and I've taken it from our church's statement of faith, the Baptist faith and message. And so again, as our habit, I'll ask the question and ask you to join me with the answer. It's printed on the inside of your bulletin. It will also be on the screen behind me. So here is the question. What is the Bible? You join me in answering The Holy Bible was written by men, divinely inspired, and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all scripture is totally true and trustworthy. What a good word for us today. I'm going to ask the ushers to make their way and let's pray um, as we begin our time of offering. So Father, we are grateful that you have given us our Bibles. Father, that we have in our hands your very word to us. We're grateful for this time of singing together. We've had singing truth together from your word centered around the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, I I pray that in this place this morning, that, Father, you would deepen our love for the word, that you would deepen our love uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ, and, Father, that you deepen our love for one another and our love for the lost that is around us. Father, now in these next few moments as we give, Father, may our giving be uh, a continued expression of our worship as we meditate on your word and we think upon the goodness of Christ. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Join in with me if you know this song. Starts a little different than it ends, though, I will warn you. No one fly away for glory. Fly away. When I die, hallelujah, I'm Yeah. 
good stuff thank you Casey Casey I gotta admit I wasn't sure that stand was gonna hold that keyboard up for some of that I thought it was uh, I thought it was coming down for a second there I wasn't wasn't sure there well man I want to just thank everybody for uh, having me back as uh, Pastor Trevor says a couple of years ago and uh, I was here and had the privilege to get to share with you really just a few months after uh, I had taken this position as the executive director for Oklahoma Baptist and so it's been about two years. I probably look about 10 years older because these last two years have been the longest 10 years of my life. Uh, it's been an interesting challenge. So I want to bring you greetings on behalf of uh, your sister Southern Baptist churches in the great state of Oklahoma, which is about 1,736 strong, almost 1,750 churches. That's a lot of churches, and we've got them all over the, uh, all over the state. It's a beautiful state, so diverse. Uh, all the way down in southeast, northeast Oklahoma, all the hills and the, the water and the green and the grass and out here in western Oklahoma and the, the flat and the open and the beautiful sunrise, beautiful sunsets. Um, I was just telling Trevor a few days ago, I was down southwest, southeast of Altus, down there kind of in the Quartz Mountain area, way southwest corner of the state. Uh, I'm here today in Boise City, I'll be in Guyman tomorrow. Wednesday and Thursday, I'll be up in Miami and Grove, and Saturday morning, I'll be down in Hugo. And so in about eight days there, I'm going to be in every corner of the state, literally. And uh, let me tell you why I'm doing that. I think it's very important that all of our churches uh, feel a connection with their state convention. I think it's important uh, for you to get to hear from me every now and then. And uh, it's important that we have a good, solid trust uh, with the state convention. And it's important to me that you feel important. Uh, even though we're out here in Boy City, way out in the panhandle, sometimes I think y'all may think, oh, those people in Oklahoma City, they forget about us, they don't know about us. Uh, that's not true. Uh, I am very, very, very happy to be here today. Really looking forward to sharing with you here in this morning and this afternoon and this evening. I'm really, really excited to be here. Uh, I love to speak about the Bible, but uh, I just, I love our, our smaller and attendance churches, our rural churches, all of our churches. Now, let me tell you something interesting. So about 1,750 churches, right? Listen to this. 57% of those churches have fewer than 50 in attendance on Sunday morning. 90% of those churches have fewer than 150 on Sunday morning. Isn't that interesting? Uh, we're a convention of small churches. But here's the great thing. Uh, the, the great thing is it doesn't matter if you're a big church or small small church. It, it, it doesn't matter if you give a lot to the cooperative program or, or you don't give much to the cooperative program. What matters is that we're all working together. And as I've said to you before, and as I know you know, uh, your church gives to the cooperative program. It's, it's the wonderful, beautiful, unique thing about us as Southern Baptists, right? And so uh, every time you give to your church, your church is giving a percentage of its undesignated receipts uh, to the cooperative program. And essentially, you're tithing to your church. Your church is kind of tithing to the kingdom. Now, what are we doing with the cooperative program gifts? I'll just run through real quick. 
We're funding all kinds of wonderful things right here in Oklahoma. Falls Creek, Cross Timbers. By the way, let me tell you something. Falls Creek, y'all may have heard of that little camp down there in south central Oklahoma. Uh, last year, last summer, uh, the Lord set a record at Falls Creek. The most students we've ever seen in one summer come to faith in Christ. Over 2,600 students came to faith in Christ at Falls Creek. Isn't that amazing? And uh, we couldn't do it unless churches like this gave to the cooperative program. Cross Timbers, our children's camp, disaster relief, our BCMs, Baptist Collegiate Ministries, we couldn't do any of those things without churches like yours giving cooperative program. And then we have Oklahoma Baptist University, the Retirement Center, the Children's Home, Water's Edge, all of our affiliates. We couldn't do those. Those ministries could not exist without you and your support. And then we send a big chunk of the CP to the national level of the SBC, and your half of what we send there goes to the International Mission Board, and about a fourth goes to the North American Mission Board, planting hundreds of churches a year, and about another fourth goes to the six seminaries that are training students to be ministers and missionaries, you name it. By the way, let me just tell you something that's interesting. A church this size, maybe, maybe, pro but probably not, you could fully fund one family overseas on the international mission field. Most of our churches could not fund one family overseas. But you put 1,750 churches together, you put almost 50,000 Southern Baptist churches together in the nation, guess how many missionaries we have on the international mission field right now as we speak? Over 3,600 and their 2,700 children fully funded. They don't ever have to come back home and raise money and raise support. They get to stay on the mission field as God has called them, and you're supporting them and enabling them to do that because you give to your church, and your church gives to the cooperative program. Pretty cool deal, right? And so sometimes I'll have people say, when I come and speak to a small and tennis church, they'll say, oh, what does our church matter? We don't give very much money. We're not like those big churches. And I, I, I always just kind of remind them a little story in the uh, Gospels. Remember, Jesus and the disciples are sitting in the temple treasury. And the temple treasury, they had these coffers shaped like trumpets. They opened up at the end right here. And people would put their offering in as they went to worship to the temple. And some of these guys were no good guys. They were very wealthy. And they would actually exchange their money into big, big bags of coins. And they would hire men to carry the bags of coins. And they would pour the coins, make it this big old ruckus into these things just to show everybody, look at how much money I've given. And Jesus and the fellows are watching this. And all of a sudden, Jesus goes, whoa, did you guys see that? And what he's pointing at is a little bitty widow who gave not even a penny into the, into the thing. And he goes, wow, she gave more than anybody else today. And the disciples kind of look at Jesus like, man, Jesus, your math is bad. <laughs> you know, those guys poured in suitcases full of coins. And what do you mean she gave more? And Jesus says, because she gave all that she had. So the great thing about the cooperative program is that percentage a big church in Oklahoma City may give 5%, may give a quarter million dollars to the cooperative program, but it's 1% or 2% of their budget. Church like Boyce City gives almost 10% of your undesignated gifts to the cooperative program. Felt that I mentioned in Sunday school, 25%. And the Lord looks at that and loves that uh, every bit as much as he loves a bunch of money from some other church. Y'all following me now? So I just want to come and tell you, thank you, First Baptist Church, Boyce City. Thank you for being a part of the cooperative program. What an important, wonderful role this church plays in the worldwide efforts of the Southern Baptists to reach people with the, the reach the nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank y'all. Thank y'all. Now, uh, you didn't come this morning to have me just talk about the corporate program, right? Probably talked about it a little too long, but uh, I love getting to speak to churches just like this one. So I want to talk about the Bible today. And what we're going to do, we're going to just do a little message from Psalm 19 this morning. And then today at 2 and then tonight at 630, uh, I'm going to show you a really neat presentation. I got slides. I'm going to make it really interesting. I'm going to wet, I wet your whistle in Sunday school. I'm going to wet your whistle a little bit more in the message this morning for some of the really neat, amazing, wow kind of things we're going to talk about the Bible. But at the end of the day, uh, we're going to learn four things about the Bible when you leave here tonight. You'll, you'll have known four things, right? It's authoritative, it's authentic, it's accurate, and it's accessible and applicable to our lives, okay? It's authoritative, I can trust it, it's an authority over me. 
It's authentic. It really is the Word of God, inspired by God. I can trust it. It's not full of errors. It's not mythology. It's not what the culture says it is. It's accurate. Doesn't have a lot of. Doesn't have any mistakes in it. It's not all that stuff. And I actually can read it. I can study it. I can apply it and obey it in my life. So we're going to talk about that. I'm going to give you a little bit of a sample of that as we go this morning. But I want you to take your Bible with me and let's turn to Psalm 19. And we're going to read and study this morning verses 7 to 11. Psalm 19, verses 7 to 11. And this is a psalm of David. And David's going to say some very, really, really great things about the Word of God, about the Bible. Now, uh, how many of you uh, have ever had, you ever seen, you ever had to use a set of blueprints? Okay? Probably most of us had, right? You're going to build something. You're going to build a house. You're going to build some kind of building. You've got to have a set of blueprints. And the blueprints can be pretty complicated. You got a you got a page or more for the HVAC, and a page or more for the plumbing, and a page or more for the roof and the elevation, and all these kinds of things. No builder would go in to try to build a building without a blueprint, right? And then when you wanted to make a modification or a change or something comes up, what do they do? Well, they got the blueprints right over here, and they just go and they they refer to the blueprints. Well, here's our problem today. Our problem today is we got a whole lot of people trying to build a life without any blueprint. They're trying to build a marriage. They're trying to build a career. They're trying to build family. They're trying to build their own life. And they got no blueprint. And they just kind of go along, hum, ho, figure it out as they want. And then they'll kind of look and say, oh, hey, look what I built. And what they built is going to turn out to be chaos or a house of cards. Now, listen. We've got to have the Bible as a blueprint for our lives. And to me, when I read this text, when we read it here in just a second, this is kind of a feel I get from David. He's telling us all, he's going to use all these vocabulary words. And the Bible is this, and it does this for your life. It's this, and this is what it does. It's this, and this is the result. When you obey it, and read it, and study it, and make it your blueprint for life. So we got a lot of people today... Uh, that say, oh, I don't need a blueprint, or my blueprint is fine. Now, uh, 40 years ago, when I was a teenager, when I was about these people right here sitting in front of me, great group of young people here, uh, when I was a student like their age, it was about, it was about well, none of your business years ago. Um, man, even the secular culture still understood the fabric and structure of society from a, a transcendent source. And by that I mean God and the Bible. Uh, I, I could be not a Christian back in the 1980s in this country, but still kind of have, oh, this is what marriage is, and this is what gender is. But I'm going to tell you what, that ship has sailed, and it's sailed. And now today, how do we understand truth, identity, meaning, purpose. We don't understand it from God and the Bible. How do people understand it today? We understand it from me and how I feel about it, right? Oh, hey, I saw this in Instagram. Must be true. Must be good. I read that on Facebook. I read it on internet. You know, everything on the internet's true. Did y'all know that? Well, so then, you know, but here's the thing, friends. <laughs> we, in our sinful state, we, in our fickle state, we, we can't be trusted to determine the blueprint. We can't be trusted to know what really is truth, what is right and what is wrong, what is moral or immoral. We need God who created us to tell us what is true, what is right, what is moral. And that's what the Bible is. So let's read Psalm 19. And let's begin with verse 7. And let's go down to verse 11 this morning. Now, as we read, I want you to just take note of all the vocabulary words that David is going to use to describe the Bible, the Word of God. So he goes, he says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. So let me just kind of walk us through this passage for a few minutes this morning. Here, here's the first thing that I want you to see. I think I want you to see this. My response to all of this that David just said needs to be obedient. So all of the Bible, what we read in Sunday school this morning, all Scripture is inspired, breathed out by God. All of the Bible is authoritative for my life. Now, let's just, let's just keep score of the vocabulary words that Paul David has used to describe the Bible. Look what he says. In these, in these verses, he calls the Bible law, testimony, precepts, commandment, fear, and judgment. Now here's what's interesting. Six different words in the Hebrew language, but what we learn is all six of these words are essentially synonymous. Um, you know, we look at this. this is the pulpit, this is the lectern, this is the stand. I can come up with six different words, but I'm still describing the same thing. That's what, exactly what David is doing here. And so what I think David's doing by using six different words to describe the Bible uh, he's looking at the Bible as a whole. Sometimes we look at the Bible, we break it out in genre. This is apocalyptic, this is prophetic, this is narrative, and that is important as we interpret the Bible. But we cannot forget that the Bible is actually one long big story. The fancy word for it is a meta-narrative. Uh, sometimes I'll have people say, uh, oh, hey, preacher, <clears throat> I, I bet you couldn't sum the whole Bible up in one word, could you? And I always say, sure I can, Easy. I can sum the whole Bible up in one word. Here's the word, redemption. Because the first two chapters of the Bible is how God created the universe, created the world, everything perfectly. And then Genesis 3, all the way to the end of Revelation, is about how we messed it all up with our sin and how God is redeeming it all through the person, His Son, Jesus Christ. So it's one big long story. All those animals that get sacrificed in the Old Testament just kicking the can down the road to the altar of sacrifice in Jesus. In fact, all the, everything we're reading in the Old Testament is a big flashing neon arrow pointing to Jesus and how he redeems it and how he fulfills all of it. And the other interesting thing here is that notice this again. Law, testimony, precepts, commandment, fear, judgments. Notice that all of these things are things you obey. Isn't that fascinating? Why do we have laws in this country? Do we read the laws in this country and go, oh, hey, that sounds fun. That sounds interesting. No, there's laws to be obeyed. Why does a court make a judgment? When the court makes the judgment, you got to abide by it. So all of these words in here are things that we obey. You know, I think about Matthew 8, kind of a rough and tough centurion. He comes to Jesus, and he, and he says to Jesus, you know, Jesus... Uh, I'm a man who knows all about authority. I say, come to my men, and they come. I say, go to my men, and they go. And he says, I want to put myself under your authority. And this man understood that when Jesus says something, that's it. When Jesus says something, it's going to happen. When Jesus says something, it is to be obeyed. Now, notice how David gives all of these words, vocabulary words, but then notice the result, what? They revive the soul. They make us wise. They rejoice our heart. They enlighten our eyes. They do all these wonderful things for us. So here's what happens. When you choose to make the Bible your authority, some really great things happen, but if you do not make it your authority, then those things aren't going to happen. Well, let's think about this. This is not unique to me. I read this, heard this years, years, years ago. I just kind of remember it in my mind. There's a lot of Christians today that don't want this book to be their authority. Now, let's just think about the way, sometimes the way people, even Christians, people claim to be Christians, how they, how they treat it, okay? Uh, some people treat the Bible like an hors d'oeuvre tray. You ever been to a party? I, don't, I know what an hors d'oeuvre is. Do not ask me how to spell it, okay? <laughs> it's just the little finger food you eat for the... the, the now, what is an hors d'oeuvre? If you've ever been at a fancy party, I haven't ever really been to a fancy party. I guess I've just seen it on a TV show or movie. But you go to a fancy party, and they, they bring out the hors d'oeuvre tray, right? And they bring out the hors d'oeuvre tray, and they, 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 would you like to have one of these hors d'oeuvres? 
And then you, what do you do with the hors d'oeuvres? You kind of scan them, right? You look at them up and say, well, that one looks interesting. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't touch that one with the 10-foot pole. Uh, that one looks like it was made out of dog food. Uh, I'll try this one. And here's the problem with a lot of Christians today. A lot of Christians treat the Bible like an hors d'oeuvre tray. We pick and choose the parts we like and don't like. And oddly enough, what are the parts in the Bible a lot of people choose to like? The parts about God's love that gives you warm fuzzies, warm feelings. What are the parts of the Bible we don't like? We don't like the parts about hell and judgment and I'm a sinner and I need to repent. So listen, look at me. If you're picking and choosing the parts of the Bible you like and don't like, it's not an authority in your life. Uh, sometimes Christians treat the Bible like a rental car insurance at the airport. <laughs> you ever had to get that before? You go to rent a car. I don't, I don't know if people rent a car anymore. They all Uber now. But if you go rent a car, right, you sign all the paperwork, and what do they do? They say, would you like to have rental car insurance? And you go, I don't know. How much is that? Oh, it's like $40 a day. And you think, do I need this insurance at $40 a day? And you think, I haven't had a wreck in 30 years. I'm a good driver. I probably don't need the insurance, so I'll pass. And a lot of times, that's how we treat the Bible. Well, I probably don't really need it, so I'll just be without it. Here's another one that Christians do sometimes. Uh, we treat the Bible like wearing a seatbelt. Okay? Now, can we just have a little moment of honest transparency and confession? Why do you wear a seatbelt? probably two reasons, okay? Some of y'all might actually wear a seatbelt. Oh, I want to be safe. But others of y'all, the reason you wear a seatbelt is because I don't want to get a ticket. Can we be honest? Yes. And the other one, and here's the big reason, I'll wear that seatbelt so I don't hear, have to hear that loud chime, right? Ding, 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 ding. And you're like, man, I want to reach in there and you yank that out, right? Ding, 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 ding. Okay, I'll put it on. That's kind of why we treat the Bible sometimes. You know, you know what? I'm going to get up this morning and I'm going to read a little bit of the Bible because I'll feel guilty if I don't. I want to get that ding, ding, ding out of the back of my head. Uh, do we have any math teachers in here? Anybody? Math teachers? Okay, good, because I don't want to offend anybody. But here, sometimes we treat the Bible like geometry. How many really like geometry in school? <laughs> One guy, the guy leading worship. Uh... Man, I hated geometry in school. I couldn't figure it out. You, but you know, why, you know why I hated geometry? You know why I hated math back in high school? You know why? Because back then, not only was it hard to understand, but the other one was, I didn't think I'd ever need it. Why would I ever use this? Oh, this Bible's got too many complicated things in it. It's too hard to understand, so I just... Friends, if your approach to the Bible is like any of what I just said, then it's really not an authority over your life. So when, it, when we make the Bible an authority, here's some of the things that happen. All right, let's look at the text, verse 7. In verse 7, Paul says that the Bible is perfect. And so what, we mean, what he means by that when he says it revives the soul, the Bible being perfect tells me about salvation. So here's the first thing. Do you want to know the world's greatest problem? The world's greatest problem is lostness. And the Bible is the only book that gives us the answer to what that problem is, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about the Bible today, we're going to talk about it as an authority. We're going to talk about all these super cool things. But listen, here's step one. Step one is, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then that's, you got to have that first. Because this is just kind of going to be a little bit of words on a page and these words on a page are pointing you to turn from your sin and selfishness and thinking that there's anything in the world that'll fill my bucket, anything in the world that'll really give me truth and identity and meaning, purpose, nothing in the world can do that. Only Jesus Christ can do that. So the Bible tells me that I am fallen. I've fallen short of the glory of God. It tells me I am a sinner. It tells me that Jesus Christ who was God in the flesh, who is perfect, who lived, who was born of a virgin, who lived a sinless life, who gave his life on the cross for me. Jesus lived the life I was supposed to live, and Jesus died the death I was supposed to die. You think about it. And so only in my relationship with Christ and turning to him in faith and not trusting in me or what I can do, but in who he is and what he did for me, 
Can I be right with him? And that's really, truly the only way that my soul is revived. Now, I, I saw right here, it looks like y'all got some Easter decorations up here still. We had Easter last Sunday, right? Was that last Sunday? Two Sundays? When was it last Sunday? Listen, think about it. We celebrated the re resurrection of Jesus, okay? Now, here's the thing. I, I, I have people say to me from time to time that when I get to engage with the folks, say, now, I don't want to believe in God. I don't want to believe in church. I don't believe in any of that stuff because I don't believe in the Bible. Okay, well, why don't you believe in the Bible? Because there's parts of the Bible that offend me. There's parts of the Bible I don't like. And so my response is always, well, is the fact that you don't like parts of the Bible, did that prevent Jesus from rising from the dead? And so here's the reality. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then nothing he said matters at all. Right? But if he rose from the dead, and he did, then everything he said matters. And that means you're going to have to deal, whether you like it or not, with everything that he said. If I walked into this room and I said, hey, everybody, I am the son of God who alone can give you salvation, and then I ate a Snickers bar, y'all would all go, big deal. But if I come in here and say that same thing and raise myself from the dead, you better listen to everything I got to say. And so that's what we got to, we're talking about this with Jesus. I'm talking about this with the Bible. Uh, only the Bible tells me about salvation and how to be right with him. Here's the second thing. Being reliable, look at the next part of verse 7. Being reliable, the Bible is worthy of my trust. Hey, look right here, folks. Can I really trust this book? This is a lot of what we're going to talk about this afternoon and tonight. Can I really trust this book? How do I know this isn't a bunch of made-up believe, make-believe stuff? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, all those dudes, they just got together at a Jerusalem Starbucks and made all this stuff up. Uh, can I wet your whistle for this afternoon and tonight? Okay. At the end of the day, we believe in God and we believe in the Bible on the basis of faith. But just because you believe in God and believe the Bible is His Word does not mean you've checked your brains at the door. It's a very reasonable faith. All right, so watch this. Can I? I can walk down here, can I? Can y'all still see me and this thing's not going to squeal? Okay, watch this. Ready? Real super fast, real super fast. It's hard to preach when it's potluck day because I can smell all that food coming out that door. <clears throat> and so can y'all right here. I say, Hurry up. Come on, man. I can smell some fried chicken or something down there. Um, okay. <clears throat> here's, here's the thing. Some people, sometimes people say, well, I don't believe in the Bible because the originals don't exist. Okay? All right? And then if somebody says that to you, I don't believe in the Bible because we don't have what Paul really wrote or what Matthew really wrote. All right, here's what you say. In a very Jesus-loving, kind, respectful way, you say, the original document to no ancient document exists. We have nothing that Plato or Aristotle or Socrates ever wrote. Because we didn't have a printing press until the 16th century, 14th, 15th century. So until the printing press, everybody just copied things by hand. So that's the big rub, right? Well, how do I know that, that all these copies, you know, how, how, so let me just give you one little sample of going, some of the stuff we're going to do today, all right? Secular science grades the credibility of an ancient text by two standards. Here they are, and they relate to those copies. Okay, here they are. The first standard is how many pre printing press ancient copies of this text exist? How many? And then the second criteria is how close to the original is the date of the oldest copy? Okay, does that make sense? Because the lesser the amount of time, the lesser the opportunity or possibility of scribes making mistakes. Okay, do y'all follow me? Number of copies, age between when it was written to when the first copy appears. Okay, so let's, let's, let's just play a little game. Y'all want to? Let's do this two-criteria thing with an ancient text from a guy named Julius Caesar. By the way, how many of y'all believe a man named Julius Caesar actually lived and existed? You'd all raise your hand. It's kind of an ill irony here. If you walk into a college classroom today, how many of y'all believe a guy named Julius Caesar lived? All the hands go up. How many of y'all believe that a man named Jesus lived? The hands start coming down. How many of y'all believe that the Bible is really the, mo the most authentic book in history? All the hands keep coming down. 
Julius Caesar wrote a book called Gallic Wars in 50 BC. By the way, you can buy Gallic Wars on Amazon, and uh, I've read it because I'm a nerd. And I will tell you right now, if you have trouble sleeping at night, buy that book. It'll knock you right out. That was a joke. Uh, what is Gall Gallic Wars is Julius Caesar's military campaigns in modern-day France and Spain. Do you know when he wrote Gallic Wars? He wrote Gallic Wars in 50 B.C. Okay. Guess how many copies of Gallic Wars exist in libraries and museums today? How many copies of Gallic Wars exist? Eight or nine. And we know where they are. We got them all documented. Uh, I, I, think, I think it's like eight copies. I, I have the exact number this afternoon. It's eight or nine. Eight copies. And, and secular science says, well, that's pretty good. That's a good number of copies. Pre-printing press for that. Okay, what is the oldest copy? So of the eight copies, what's the earliest one? Okay, the earliest one is, ready? About 850 A.D. So there is 900 years between when he wrote it and the oldest copy. And secular science says, that's pretty good. Eight copies, 900 years. Good. You want to play that game with the New Testament? Guess how many copies in full or part exist of the New Testament? Uh, eight, nine, 20? How about this? How about almost 6,000? 6, 6,000, not eight. And by the way, if you move that number, if you move that from, from just Greek, if you go to Ariac, if you go to Syriac, Aramaic, and Coptic, the 6,000 number goes to 25,000. Not eight, 25,000. And remember what I said about Gallic Wars? It's 900 years gap. It's kind of a long time, but science says it's pretty good. Do you know what the gap between the oldest part of the New Testament and when the one was written? John wrote the Gospel of John about 90 A.D. Do you know the date of the oldest fragment of John's Gospel that we have? How about 135 A.D.? About 45 years, not 900 years. Now, I'm going to tell you, you look right here, put your eyes on my eyes. I'm going to tell you this. I believe in God and the Bible on the basis of faith, first and foremost. But I'm telling you right now, by secular science's own standards, there is no more authentic book in the history of man than the book I'm holding in my hand. And you have not checked your brains at the door to believe that this is the product of the mind of God. So when he says at the end of verse 7 here, I can trust this, yes, I can do it. All right, now let's keep moving because I'm about to run out of time and y'all are hungry, you can smell food. Let's go to verse 8. Hey, being true, right, the Bible gives me joy. Look at verse 8. When he says the word is, it's right. See that? The precepts are right and we rejoice in them. So here's the thing then. When I follow the Bible and obey the Bible and make it my authority, it doesn't just give me happiness, which is superficial, but it gives me joy. And here's another big knock that the, that, that, that the culture has against the Bible. Well, I don't want to follow the, I don't want to follow the commands in there because they're so restrictive. You know, you can't do this and you can't do that. Hey, I want to say this to you. Can you hear me? Listen to me. Not one single command in this Bible is meant to make you miserable. Did you know that? It is actually for your good and your well-being. And when the Bible says you should not do this and you should not do that, you should not do that. You know why? Because when you do that, it's always going to end up bad for you. So the, following the Bible, oh man, it may not give me happiness like the world thinks, but it will give me joy and peace and contentment. Look at the other part of verse 8. Look, being radiant... The Bible enlightens me to practical wisdom. Look what he says in verse 8. When I follow the Bible, my eyes are enlightened. Remember Psalm 119, 105? Your word is a light unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now, I'm going to tell you what, y'all. Can y'all can, can y'all can y'all testify with me here? That living life, there's a lot of pitfalls in life. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I take this job? Should I buy that thing? Should I marry this person? Should I go to that school? Should I do this career change? And when I'm submissive to God and I'm following reading his word, the word is going to enlighten my path. Okay, now watch this. 
Um, I have one son and two daughters. My son has loved Legos since like the day he was born, okay? My son just turned 27 and still loves Legos, <laughs> okay? Now they make adult Legos. They're like really hard to build and put together and all this stuff. But uh, when my son first started really getting into Legos, like early elementary school, man, he'd, he'd get them all out on his floor, and he'd be playing and playing and building with them, and we'd say, all right, son, it's time to go to bed. And he'd have somebody say, just, you know, just get in bed, we'll clean them up later. Okay, so he'd get in bed, he'd have his little nightlight on, and, and he'd try to read or something, and he'd fall asleep. So we'd always go check on him, okay? So here's the deal. My job was I went in there to make sure Zach was asleep, and I'd turn the light out. Okay, here's the problem. You don't want to be walking in a dark room full of Legos with no shoes on your feet. Can I get an amen or an oh me? So you know what I'd do? <laughs> here's, here's what I'd do. I would, the, the lamp was over there by his bed. So you had to walk into the room, right, to turn the lamp off? Okay, <laughs> so, so when you turn the lamp off, right, you can't turn the overhead light on, you'll wake him up. When you turn the lamp off, you got a minefield of Legos between you and the door. So here's what I'd do. I'd walk over there to the lamp, and before I turn the lamp off, I would map out the Legos on the floor, right? I would say, there's one there, and there's one there. Here's a safe spot, here's a safe spot. And I would map it out while the light was still on, and then I'd turn the light off, and then this is how I'd get out of the room. Like this, because I'd mapped it out, and it's like, whoo, safe, I made it. This is what the Bible does, folks. The Bible, if I read it and believe it and trust it and apply it and obey it in my life, the Bible is going to say, step right here, but you don't want to step right there. Step right here, but you don't want to step right there. Step right here, you don't want to step right here. All right, look at this. Almost done. Here comes verse 9. Being pure, the Bible provides me with unchanging truth. You see this in verse 9? It endures forever. The rules of the Lord are righteous altogether. The problem is, we don't tend to think that way, and the world doesn't tend to think that way, okay? All right, let's, can we do one little exercise before we go eat lunch? And then we're going to come back, and we're going to do some more of this uh, fun stuff. All right, look right here. I brought a jar, and inside of this jar are miniature Chips Ahoy cookies and peanut M&Ms, two of my favorite things, which I may be eating later this afternoon, unless one of y'all takes them from me. All right, now here we're going to play a game, all right? I'm going to use the young people right here in front of me. All right, I'll let you see all these cookies and M&Ms in here? Okay. What's your name, young lady? Okay. Anna, will you, I want you to do something for me. Guess how many pieces are in this jar. I know the number, but I want you to take a guess. How many M&Ms and cookies are in this jar? Go. She's trying to count. <laughs> Don't have time for you to count. Guess. 95. 106. Okay, 95, 106, 215. Y'all remember those numbers? You guys are on the right here on the second row. Y'all remember the 95, 106, 215. Okay. Uh, the exact number of pieces in this jar is 162. So who is right? Which one? Right. You're the closest. Of the three numbers guessed, and I know the number, which one is correct? The number right there, okay? Now, let's, let's do a little different game. Tell me your favorite song. What's your favorite song? You don't know. You know your favorite song? Any of you people know a favorite song? What's your favorite song? It's something by George Strait, Carry Your Love With Me. C carry your love with me. Carry your love with me. What's your favorite song? 10,000 Reasons. What's your favorite song? Surfing USA by the Beach Boys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, did you hear the three songs? Uh, carry Your Love by George Strait, 10,000 Reasons, and Surfing USA. Okay, now which one of those is right? You see what I'm getting at here? When it comes to just straight up numbers, I can easily say, well, this one's right. But when it comes to songs, well, that's just a matter of preference. But that goes back to what I just taught you. The world today views truth 
not by the facts. Right? By the way, we don't like facts today. You know, you, we do not determine truth by facts. You know how we determine truth? We determine truth by likes. That's what you do on Facebook. You like it. That's what you do on Instagram. You love it. And so here's the thing. What, what David is saying about the Bible is the world today says truth is not like guessing the at number. The world today says truth is like, what's your favorite song? My friends, if you live your life based on that, you're going to end up in the rubble one day. But truth is truth. Facts. And where do we find truth? Where do we find the facts? We find it in the Bible. So here's the last one. Verse 9. Look at this. Being righteous, the Bible warns me of error, and it reminds me of reward. You know, it was uh, John Bunyan that said, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. Right? So when I follow the Bible and make it an authority in my life, the reward is real. So we're going to talk more about it today, this afternoon and tonight. Uh, I got cool stories about Dead Sea Scrolls. We'll play this Julius Caesar game a little bit more. I got all kinds. Of, I ain't got a big picture of a snake. You name it. You do not want to miss today, 2 and 6.30. We're going to dive into all of this, okay? So I'm going to leave you with this thing. Here's an old evangelist named Gypsy Smith. An old evangelist, a guy came up to Gypsy Smith and said one time, he said, he said, Gypsy, he said, I've been through the whole Bible and it doesn't do anything for me. I've been through every page of it. I've been through it all and it's just got nothing for me. And Gypsy says, uh, yeah, but has the Bible been through you? Have we really yielded ourselves to what it says, to obey it in our lives and to allow it to be the authority over us? So let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you so much for your wonderful word. Thank you for the psalm today that tells us these wonderful things about the Bible. And a reminder today, God, that the Bible is your, your word to us. It is truth. There's lots of things that the world says are true. There's lots of things that the world says will give us life and give us happiness and give us meaning and identity and purpose. But Father, we only find it in Jesus Christ. And your Bible is your word to us that tells us that finding identity and meaning and purpose is found in obeying and following you, Jesus. So God, I want to pray for anyone this morning that maybe does not have that relationship with you. Today, Father, I pray that they would turn from whatever it is they're trying to fill their bucket and they would turn to you in faith. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and rising from the dead doing for us what we could not do for ourselves so that we could be right with you and have abundant life today and eternal life one day. Father, maybe there's some people here today who are treating the Bible like an hors d'oeuvre tray or wearing a seat belt or geometry or real estate or rental car insurance. Some of us today, Father, need to get more serious about our love for the Word, our study of the Word, and our obe obeying the Word. I pray, God, that your Spirit would speak to us in that way. So, Lord, however you would want us to respond to you now, would you speak to us to do that? And lead us, Father, just to come and yield ourselves to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Jesus tells us that when we have failed to make the Bible the center of our lives, the authority in our lives, that the right response is the word repent. And repent means to change direction, to change, to stop, um, to, make, to recenter the Bible in our lives. And so I think the invitation for us is clear this morning. If, if the word of God, if the gospel of Jesus Christ is not the center of your life today. The invitation is to repent and to make the scriptures and make Christ your center. In just a moment, we're going to sing a, a final song together, and then I'll come back and, and give us some instruction and pray for us. Um, but if this morning uh, you're here and you need to repent, uh, recenter your life upon Christ, maybe for the first time, make Christ the center of your life, we would invite you to make that choice as we sing this song together. Um, would you join me in standing?
and let's sing together. i